women. And uh, thanks for hosting this and inviting me to uh, speak on, on a topic that, that really is near and dear to me and for multiple reasons, partly because of uh, research interest, but, but also a lot of clinical trials in this arena. And I know that there's a lot of trainees online that uh, I think this is a great way uh, where when you get into practice and in, in the biomarker world to start to keep involved in research. Um, I think the majority of the biomarker work recently has been um, the, the clinical trials have been in the private sector. And so it can range from somebody academic like myself to uh, private practice to large group practices that are really, I think, integral to pushing the field ahead and getting the um, getting the biomarker studies done. So I'm going to give you um, a talk on biomarkers. And again, this will be a little bit of, uh, let me see if my thing isn't, isn't um, maybe I'll just push the button here. Yeah. Um, I have a few disclosures. Uh, there are some relevant ones. I have a lot of research funding from the companies, uh, which I'll discuss today and, and try to stay really uh, high level with them. Uh, but you can read the read the company names right there uh, as far as the biomarker companies. Here are the learning objectives. The first is um, just to understand biomarkers that are available for the diagnostics um, in prostate cancer. I'm going to talk about tissue-based biomarkers quite a bit for risk stratification. And then um, at the very end, just I think it's the most important is to understand when to use them uh, and which clinical scenarios to pull out the biomarker off the shelf, at, so to speak, and to start using them. Um, I always start out with this slide, and for those of you who might have heard me speak before, this is a challenge, and I put this out there a, a little bit tongue-in-cheek. It's a breast cancer guideline, um, but I think it's very relevant for prostate cancer because this is in the post-diagnostic setting for, for breast cancer. Breast cancer is incredibly fortunate they, in many ways because they are biomarkers embedded within the culture uh, of how they treat their patients. Um, and the examples would be, uh, of course, there's hormone receptor positive status or negative status, or HER2. And then there's this 21 gene assay that's, again, embedded within their guidelines. If you, uh, in, in addition to, to this, this, this 21 gene RT-PCR assay actually had a a major uh, a trial that was uh, released on thousands of women basically saying that this biomarker could save a substantial portion of women um, from getting chemotherapy. So it really is a, a directed biomarker to dictate therapy. Which again, when you look at the prostate cancer guidelines, again, I almost find it laughable that here's our guidelines, you know, uh, for low risk prostate cancer, it can range from doing nothing, absolutely nothing, which is for surveillance, of course, to doing uh, radical therapies with side effects. And even if one had a radical therapy and had adverse features, uh, they, there's, the, uh, there's a choice of either doing nothing or doing, again, more therapy with side effects. And there's no biomarker at all on this page. Um, and we're working towards that point. But at this point in time, there is no biomarker on our page as far as what is standard of care. This is the same page for intermediate risk. And again, going from favorable intermediate risk, going from doing nothing initially in active surveillance or doing something radical. And again, regardless of if there's lymph nodes or anything like that, no biomarker on this page to help us in prostate cancer. And this is in the post-diagnostic setting. So I think that's, that's where we start out. That's the challenge is we have to try to get biomarkers there. This is a list, a partial list of the disease state biomarkers. And I think this deserves updating and uh, from my standpoint every year because biomarkers pop in and, and in my opinion, pop out. I mean, there were some biomarkers that have showed up through on this list over the last 15 years that started some investigations and then they, they got dumped because they didn't work. And then there are others that have stayed for a long time. And again, for sakes of time, I'll just say right now, I can't cover all of them, first of all. Um, and we, I'm happy to talk about any of them that I miss in the Q&A. Uh, secondly, each of them, I really probably only have time to have like the seminal paper. So again, if you want to talk about the newer papers that have come out, I'd be happy to do that uh, in the Q&A uh, as well. So again, I know that there are a lot of trainees on board and I, for, for the sakes of them, the next few slides is mostly just sort of background, um, a little bit more academic focus um, uh, for the trainee out there as far as what makes a biomarker get on this list or what makes a biomarker uh, something that we should study. So there are several biomarker issues that we always think about when we develop biomarkers and there's a list right there and, and you know, where, what's the target, what's the source, how does it perform, how easy is it, what's the cost. 
And I think years ago, um, someone came up with sort of the ideal biomarker characteristics and they're listed on this screen. And I, again, I think for those of you that are uh, entering the world of biomarkers or in there already, I think when we look at this list, you say that clearly uh, the best biomarkers will uh, qualify, qualify for everything on this list. The problem is uh, there's always one or two that, that are missed. And sometimes it's cost, uh, honestly, because many of these biomarkers cost quite a bit. Um, uh, others are easy assays. Some of them de uh, demand tissue that's hard to get. But again, the, the ideal biomarker should be sensitive to what you're trying to find. It should correlate with some meaningful outcome. Uh, it should be very reproducible and a quick assay, preferably. Preferably low cost and, and an easy assay as well. So we'll we'll think about these characteristics later in our discussion. The other issue is what are the targets? And in general, again, on an academic level, I think about this as something about a protein. Is it something like a methylation type marker? And it, this depends on how we're going to uh, assay or measure this. Or is it something like a gene rearrangement? I mean, th this is in other cancers. There are gene rearrangements um, that we we look for. Or is it some some form of DNA polymorphism, and I won't have time to go into that at all. But is it something that the patient inherits from their parents? It has nothing to do with a, a, a mutation during lifetime, but it's a, it's a DNA a germline mutation. And again, there are so various sources and uh, all of them have their pros and cons. I mean, tissue, as I said, is hard to get. You have to get a biopsy of something, um, but it's a very rich source uh, of RNA, DNA, protein, and so forth. Blood and urine are a lot easier to get, and I'm going to run through some biomarkers in each of those compartments, tissue, blood, um, and, and urine. The other thing that we always, that I always think about, and I think for on a biomarker level, uh, again, for the, more for the trainees, is, is where you're really looking at the biomarker. Is it, is it in the diagnostic setting? And if it's in the diagnostic setting, is it in a screening population? Is it in a post uh, a referral population? Is it with PSA, is it without PSA? I'll say right now that PSA is here to stay. Uh, I cannot see a biomarker, at least at this point in time, supplanting PSA. And, and most of the biomarkers that I'll show now are biomarkers that are trying to help PSA out. Is it in, um, uh, how about the after the diagnosis? So is it before treatment, after treatment? How do you use that with other parameters? And then really, what are you, what are you trying to find? The risk of prostate cancer, uh, any prostate cancer, or is it bad prostate cancer and so forth? And so we'll, we'll work through these uh, as we go. The last couple of issues or the last issue really is, is regulatory. And again, I, we could have a whole talk on uh, how you get an assay validated and from the ground up, but just looking through this, this is for really the FDA and this is for companies, but it, but it is very important to understand um, how we develop biomarkers. So those are a little bit, that's a little bit of background. Um, let's talk about uh, markers to aid in the diagno diagnosis of, of prostate cancer. And um, here are the ones that I'll kind of briefly cover. Um, and again, many of you uh, that are in practice, particularly are already using these um, in, their day, in their daily practices. And I'll, I'll, I'll run through just a little bit of the history of all of them. And again, I don't really have time to, to give, you know, like one paper on each because uh, um, uh, we can save the rest for the Q&A. So this is the PHI the, or the Prostate Health Index. Um, you know, this was this was written almost ten years ago. The the seminal one of the seminal articles by Bill Catalona that had uh, this idea of looking at the various isoforms of PSA. So pro PSA, free PSA, total PSA, and in general, they came up with a with a formula after. And I've talked to Dr. Catalona about this several times. It was just basically the formula that performed the best. And they did all sorts of permutations of those parameters, and they came up with this. And it's it. I every time I look at it, I say it's kind of unusual to look at, but it's pro PSA over free PSA times the square root of total PSA. And again, you ask how they come up with that. It was basically after many permutations, the one that worked the best for the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And here's some of the data. Um, and you see here that as the PHI score increases from less than 25 uh, on up, that the relative risk of prostate cancer greatly increases. And not only that, you go from an 11% chance of having prostate cancer, so 1 in 10, uh, to a 1 in 2 uh, with a high PHI score. And I, I would note that it is be it performs best with a PSA already elevated or mildly elevated between 2 and 10. All right, this was, that, this was the original work. 
And there's been multiple, multiple papers written on this uh, since that point in time. And this is just one of them, again, a couple of years later from, from the Italian group, because one of the questions that always comes up is, does it, is it better than free PSA? Um, and I put this up here for two reasons. One, to show that it did look like the PHI with this yellow line is better than percent free PSA. But I put it up here, the other reason is percent free PSA actually works pretty well. And for for maybe those who have been in practice for a while, if they're on the line, I, I would think they, they, they know this because percent free of PSA does actually work much better than PSA by itself. And I think is an unappreciated um, uh, assay that we've had for years. I mean, actually now 20 years or more uh, percent free PSA. Uh, there have been multiple uh, other studies. This is decision curve analysis, again, showing that PHI does perform better um, than percent free PSA or, or PSA alone. Um, again, they show it both in those that have had a previous biopsy as well as those who have never had a biopsy, and it might reduce the biopsy rate by as much as a third, which is a, quite a significant uh, uh, gain um, when one thinks about the number of men getting, a, getting um, prostate biopsies. It's also associated with aggressive disease, but again, I, I always come up with a lot of these questions. I mean, a lot of these assays has a, still a question of at what threshold do you recommend a biopsy? At, at, you know, if you go back to that slide, is it is it over 30? There's There are recommendations from the company, but I think it's a continuum, and I think it's hard for a patient to understand, and us as urologists understand where to, where to draw that line with regards to PHI. The other one that's used quite a bit is, is the 4K score, and there's more and more data coming out in the 4K score. I'm just going to show the initial data. It's been approved in Europe for years, and it does improve the diagnosis of prostate cancer over all other forms. So they're using, again, uh, intact PSA, total PSA, free PSA, and then there's this thing called HK2, which is a calocrine. And um, it's been extensively studied, again, reduces biopsy rates by at least a third. Um, and then uh, the key thing about 4K, which is different from PHI, is the 4K actually is the chance of having high-grade pathology. So it's Gleason, Gleason pattern four or more, or Gleason grade group two or greater. And so it might be a little more relevant because it really predicts um, relevant cancer, not any cancer. And, and again, we can talk about that later. Here are the multiple cohorts. You can see here that thousands of patients in Europe over, over many years, this is 10 years ago, of course, but they've looked at how in a retrospective fashion, how it worked. There was one prospective study and, and these are the data. Um, uh, Dip and Preck was the first author a while ago was uh, presented at the AUA, and then this is the this is the seminal U.S. paper. And what they did was they decided to compare the 4K score to PCPT risk calculator, um, which uses PSA, of course, and free PSA. And it did show that that it, if you compare it compare it to either the PCPT risk calculator or just regular PSA, that the 4K score did much better for the diagnosis of high grade prostate cancer. And again, it's high grade prostate cancer, not any cancer. This is the report one obtains, and uh, you can see that the 4K score, as I said, is the positive predictive value for having high-grade prostate cancer. Um, and uh, the um, negative predictive value is, of course, 1 minus the 4K score. Many people ask me uh, which is better, 4K or PHI, and there's been one study that looked at it, and it looks like they uh, perform pretty similar. I mean, PHI is in red and 4K is in green. You can see the lines are pretty similar. Um, it, they both reduce the biopsy rate, of course, by about 30%. This paper has been a little bit criticized, just to be transparent, by particularly by the 4K folks who have looked at a different analysis showing that 4K might be slightly better in, in these statistical analyses. But what I say to most, um, and I've used them both, uh, is that both are better than what we have now, which is PSA, um, particularly for high-grade disease. I'm going to switch now to kind of urine, um, and I'm going to really go quickly on the PCA3 because I think, uh, again, for those of you in practice, um, use this for a long time. This is well over 10, 15 years old, and um, I think it's um, not being used as much in, in part because there's another urine-based assay, which we'll talk about, but PCA3 clearly was the first on the market, and uh, the good thing about PCA3 is that initially it was not related at all to how big the prostate is. So we know that as the prostate size goes up, PSA goes up with PCA3, not related to prostate volume at all. Um, it does correlate with grade and tumor volume. And here's one of the initial reports. And this was, again, several years ago, Lenny Marks 
And when you look at this, a low PCA3 score here, about a one in 10 chance of having prostate cancer, a high PCA3 score over here, again, over 50%. Um, uh, you might look at this and say that looks very similar in some sort of realm to PHI. And it is in, in some ways of giving you a score and saying where it, your chance of having prostate cancer are. At th this point in time, again, this has gone out of favor in, in many ways, although it's still being used in, in some settings. There was a major, major study um, that was uh, uh, led by John Way and the Early Detection Research Network, and maybe some of you on, on the call here, um, that looked at this and went to the FDA. And they did a study, and we did a study, we were part of it, and it was 1,000 men about. And when we looked at the number of people, and this is what they went to the FDA with. And I'll pause here and say this is all about statistics. So they said there were men that had uh, uh, never had a biopsy, and their PSA3, PCA3 score was over 60. They had a very high positive predictive value. So it was 80% of those men were going to have prostate cancer. Conversely, if you took men who had previously had a biopsy, so they previously had a negative biopsy, and they had a PCA3 score that was less than 20, they had a very high NPV, so the negative predictive value, in other words, the, the, the chance that, that there's no cancer in there, was nearly 90%. Now, the story is the FDA looked at those two results, and they said, uh, I never had a biopsy, and you need a PCA3 over 60, that's not many people. But wow, look at this, men that have had a, neg a negative bias previously, and you have a low PCA3 score, the NPV is almost 90%, that's great. And the FDA approved PCA3 based on this data, not based on the initial biopsy, the high P positive predictive value, it was based on the NPV. So I tell uh, you know my residents and so forth that NPV is king, uh, because I think that giving your patients the assurance that there's nothing going on in the prostate, um, in my opinion, I think is, well, certainly what the FDA thought was the most important. And I think that it is something that our patients resonate with, like, oh, a very high NPV, I'm not gonna have uh, prostate cancer or something in this case, high-grade prostate cancer. Sorry, I'm getting a call here. Okay, um, the, the next is um, uh, the combination. And I, again, for my M University of Michigan colleagues, they, they always criticize if I don't put something about here about combining this fusion protein with PCA3. This is marketed as something called MIPS. The combination of the two is better than one, either by itself. Um, and again, I would say stay tuned because this one still has some work to do and there's some, some major efforts looking at the combination of these two together. I'll end the urine ones um, with uh, this one, which is, uh, this was one of the very first papers again, on a test that's uh, called Select MDX. And again, many of you, I think in practice are using this already. Um, and there were two trials, um, it was a company called MDX Health, uh, of about a thousand patients and they combined them, they looked at a urine marker um, of two, actually the, the, the marketed uh, uh, platform is just on two of the markers. And they looked at posterior urine, and again, the endpoint was high-grade cancer, not any cancer, but high-grade cancer. And when they really looked at this, it outperformed the PCP risk calculator, and you can see that on the on the AUC over there. And it could reduce biopsies by almost a half. Again, if the goal was only to find high-grade cancer, not any cancer. And as I said on on one of the previous slides, NPV is king. And if you look at the NPV of this, it was over 90 percent, 94 percent for high-grade cancer basically saying if the test was negative, you could tell your patient there's a 94% chance or 93% chance that uh, they don't have high-grade prostate cancer. And again, th this is what, what is really compelling about this particular one. So I'm gonna switch gears to talk about tissue-based biomarkers. And the first one is in uh, what's called the epigenome, which is um, methylation and histone modifications. And I'm gonna talk about DNA methylation. So one of the very first early events in prostate cancer is methylation of GST pi. Um, and this was uh, 25 or 30 years ago that was described. And there is a company that's kind of capitalizing on that and saying, if we find methylation, methylation, DNA methylation in the prostate, is that is that linked to a higher chance of a prostate cancer diagnosis? So there were two uh, separate studies. One of them was this one called the Matlock study. Um, and again, some of you on, on the call, particularly in your practice, might have participated in this, but it was about 500 men. They had had a previous negative biopsy, 
and they sent the previous negative biopsy tissue to a company to look for these methylation signatures. And if they were negative, the NPV was 90%. Again, I said NPV is king. I was 90% sure there wasn't cancer in there. There was a follow-on study of just over 300 men that basically showed the same thing. They send off the negative tissue, they did a methylation test, and if it was negative, the NPV was 88% for having any cancer in the prostate. What the company's done, and now it's marketed as, as a test called Confirm MDX. What the company's done now is looked at actually the number of methylation markers for the degree of methylation. And this was the most more recent paper. Um, again, looking at the number of methylation markers for high-grade cancer now, uh, not any cancer, but high-grade cancer. Of course, it outperformed the PCPT risk calculator and it reduced biopsies by at least 30%, repeat biopsies, okay? Um, but what's amazing is the MPV was over 95% for high-grade cancer, not any cancer. And again, we can perhaps get into that in the QA. This is what the report looks like. Um, and again, what it, what it gets sent to the company is all the, all the biopsy tissue. And you can see these are all the biopsy pieces that the company looked at and they found, oh, there's some methylation here. And the instructions would be at the repeat biopsy to go here and oversample because the likelihood of high-grade prostate cancer, at least by here, because there were three, all three of the genes were methylated was as high as 50%, um, so could change practice patterns. The, the, the ones that I want to end um, uh, the rest of the talk with mostly is these three or four. I'm really going to have time to talk about three. Um, these are the th uh, Prolaris, Oncotype, and Decipher, the three that are the, the big ones on the block um, for uh, prostate cancer uh, prognostics and maybe even predictive abilities. And again, I'll, I'll go through those. Uh, one by one and 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 uh, and define them. So the first one is this one called Prolaris. It's it's uh, put up by Myriad, um, and it's based on a multiple genes. It's 31, and it's basically a cell cycle progression. So um, in medical school, we all remember like Ki67. So so how fast are cells dividing or cycle, going through the cell cycle? And it's been uh, shown in in multiple other cancers, uh, colon cancer, breast cancer that there is some relation of how fast a cell divides, of course, to um, how aggressive they are, even if they look the same under the microscope. So this company leveraged that and made a, an assay based on cell cycle progression. Uh, they have a wealth of data looking at how that is linked to mortality, how it's linked to biochemical recurrence, and maybe even decision-making. I'll show you how it works. And I have a couple of slides like this, uh, one for Prolaris, one for, for the Oncotype test, and I wanna just walk through I think it's important for you all to understand how this test might benefit. One is if we just focus on the right side of the slide here, down here is the CAPRA S, or the, this is just based on clinical factors. So number of biopsy cores, Gleason, PSA, and so forth, you can, you can, you can have a, a, formula, a formula called CAPRA S, and you can find the predicted 10-year recurrence after prostatectomy. And for a low-risk patient, uh, is down here. Um, so there, so I'm, I'm sure many of you, if you see a patient with low risk prostate cancer, you can probably tell them that with treatment, the chance of recurrence is probably only 10 to 20%. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty low. Um, with the addition of CCP or the prolaire, you can actually tell them from which dot they are. And instead of saying you only have like a somewhere in the 10 to 20, uh, uh percent, uh, chance of recurrence, it actually will, will maybe stratify from a two or 3% all the way up to a 35%. So again, it really expands uh, the ability for you to tell a patient more precisely his chance uh, of, of recurrence. This is the test that, uh, this is the result that is given. Uh, my, they, they've done some iterations of this, so it might be just a year or two old. But when one obtains a Prolaris test, you get a variety uh, of factors and information on the test. There's a you, they call it U.S. distribution. There's a 10-year mortality. There's a 10-year metastasis risk. And this one does have an active surveillance threshold that, again, we might want to talk about in the QA. But um, the one thing that I look at all these reports, and I'll mention it again, the typical patient getting this is a low-risk patient or maybe favorable intermediate risk. Mortality risk and metastasis risk at 10 years is going to be unbelievably low. It's, it's rarely over 1% or 2%. And so it's, uh, to me, it's always a, a question about whether that's really useful data uh, to have on a report. And we'll get through this at the end of the talk when I talk about some of the caveats here. They have done a couple of decision-making studies. 
Um, this one um, was about 300 patients, and they did the typical decision-making study, which is they asked the patients and the, and the docs, what are you going to do uh, uh, after the diagnosis? They give them the Prolaris test results, and then they ask them again, what are they going to do now? And they see where those things change. And in, in this report, about 65% of them did change. Uh, a lot of them were, were decreasing intensity of treatment, uh, such as going from uh, prostatectomy to watchful weight to uh, active surveillance. Um, there's another study, um, and this is just shows um, uh, the, the results of that. So there were many people that they thought they weren't going to intervene, and in truth, after they did the test, they didn't did not intervene. So there, there was no change in those, but there were several that did change going from intervention to non-intervention. Um, and again, we won't have time to go over all the details there. There was another very large study, and Neil Shore presented this, and this is now well over a thousand patients. And again, about half the patients um, and providers changed their mind uh, with, with from this test. And again, a lot of it was a de decreased burden of treatment. And I think many of this uh, these situations were going from either getting radiation or surgery to an active surveillance uh, uh, strategy because the Prolaris test said, hey, it's it's actually really low risk. It's not that bad. And I think that was part of that. Uh, the next one is Oncotype, uh, the Oncotype prostate score, and that's a, it's a, it's another sort of multi-gene thing, um, although it's multiple different pathways. So it's not just how fast the cell is proliferating or dividing. There's, there's uh, issues with androgens and the cell organization, and they, again, came up with a proprietary combination of these factors and said, can we predict adverse pathology? So... Again, in my opinion, this is kind of an unusual endpoint to try to predict, uh, predict the chance of having um, either extra capsular extension at time of prostatectomy or uh, primary pattern four. So four plus three, uh, four plus five, four plus four disease. Um, and so that was their endpoint. And again, the way that this, uh, this assay works, and I'll walk, walk you through this, is, and we can focus over here, okay, on, on this on the right side. So the inverse is likelihood of favorable pathology. So if we were to just use CAPRA or NCCN, and we had a man that was newly diagnosed with prostate cancer that was low risk, we would call them uh, over here, cap, cap, low CAPRA. And we would probably tell them that if we took their prostate out, the likelihood of favorable pathology would be somewhere in the 80 to 90%. I mean, most of those men are going to have pretty favorable pathology, and we can say you have about like 80 to 90% chance of having favorable pathology. But if we add on top of that the oncotype score, um, the, what is proposed is that we can actually tell them that their risk might be anywhere from 50 to 90, if, depending on where they are in that green line. So uh, these are all patients uh, on, the, on the line that had um, uh, low CAPRA scores, okay? Then instead of telling them they're on the dot, we could tell them they're somewhere on this green line. And that's really how the test is reported, reported to, to, to be used. Um, and again, here's their report. It might be a slightly dated report because they, they're always um, modifying them. But again, you can see the same types of things, 10-year mortality, 10-year METS risk, what their adverse pathology risk is. And again, 1% or less on most of these uh, studies, um, 1% or 2%, a very low chance of having mortality because of low risk patients. And then I always ask myself, well, what's the really expected rate of adverse pathology? I mean... Uh, this is 16%, um, but what is really the expected rate? And that's a question that that uh, we all ask ourselves. So that they've done some decision-making studies too. This is just one of them. Uh, this is the first one that they that they um, uh, showed. And again, it did show that if you have a man and you ask what he's going to do before the test, you give him the test results and then ask again, that there are some men that change. There are many that get confirmed that indeed, whatever they chose, they're going to do. Um, but then there are those that changed on either either side, either increased some did, did more or did less based on really based on their risk category. I will come back to this uh, at the end of the talk. Um, with regards to that one, I'm going to present some a little bit more original data that just was was published in JCO recently. And this was using that test to understand whether it would predict it in an active surveillance population. So not necessarily just in all men that you just diagnosed, but these are in men that have actually undergone active surveillance and seeing whether that test could predict adverse pathology um, or upgrading. Um, this is a group that I lead. It's a, a group uh, that's a national group across the country. You can see here, and, and the bottom line is there's about 2,000 patients in this study, and we're a biomarker study group. 
um, taking men on active surveillance and getting their tissue and their serum and their urine along the way to try to understand where they're gonna find better biomarkers in active surveillance. We had about 400 men and we followed them for about five years. About 100 of the 400 eventually had prostatectomy. And about half of those men actually did have adverse pathology. It sounds like a lot, but these are men that started with Gleason 6 disease, eventually got upgraded probably, or most of them did. And then when we took their prostates out, about half of them actually did have primary pattern four or T3A, or even we had some node positive disease. And we asked ourselves, does the Ocotype test predict that? We also had about 40% of these uh, uh, 400 men had an upgrading at a subsequent biopsy. Obviously not all of these men had surgery, but we asked ourselves, could the Ocotype test predict that upgrading? And I'll just show you the results. And I'm gonna skip through these slides for six of time. Just cutting to the chase. These are the univariable hazard ratios. So these are just looking at, does the test work by itself? And it did have a pretty good trend, but it wasn't quite significant to predict adverse pathology in those 100 men who had surgery. There were other factors such as just PSA density uh, or, P or a, a log PSA, which is really uh, a predictive factor. There are also, uh, what about biopsy upgrading? Well, unfortunately, uh, I thought it was unfortunate that it didn't really predict um, uh, biopsy upgrading at all, but there were a wealth of other factors that did. And these are things that, we've known about for a long time. That's been number of cores with cancer, uh, um, uh, PSA density or volume or, or, or aspects that surround um, uh, how much PSA is coming from the cancer. We did go on and look at the multivariable model. And again, if you look in any way, particularly when you add in PSA density, there on the bottom in model two, um, GPS really fell out, unfortunately, to predict adverse pathology. And when uh, you look at um, and I'm going to skip over that. When you look at how does it predict upgrading, and again, um, unfortunately, it did not predict upgrading at all, but on multivariable analysis, but uh, other factors did. So, uh, and again, this was just published in JCO like like two months ago. Um, uh, it was just just pre-COVID, so it was probably not read by anybody, but but that's all right. So this is a, a, a more regional research. I'm going to end uh, the tissue-based ones with Decipher. And um, this one uh, is by a company called Genome DX. And again, multiple different genes, multiple different pathways, um, not just cell cycle like, the, like Prolaris, but uh, it also has a genome wide platform. So they actually look at the whole genome, but they're really focusing on these 22 genes. And they probably have the most data of any of them insofar as um, getting the biomarker in clinical trials and publishing the by far the most of any group. Their endpoints really were in the post, initially in the post treatment setting. So these were men that had already received prostatectomy and they were really looking at the, they were focusing on the possibility of metastasis after prostatectomy. Um, and, and in truth, and I think the very first, yeah, just the data from this, the, some of the original data, it was largely from uh, Hopkins as well as uh, Jefferson um, and Mayo Clinic. And so they all were really uh, uh, contributing to this. And it did show that if you took men after prostatectomy, that they all looked like they had basically pretty high risk disease, but you did this test on them. And you could see, you could see that, that the men with the high test had over 50% chance of having metastasis at five years. That's very, very aggressive disease. To so even men that looked high risk after surgery, but they had less than 10% or 10% chance of having um, a, a metastatic event at, at five years. So it really stratified things uh, quite a bit. What I found probably the most interesting, which is, which um, again, I think I'll end with that and on the future directions part of the, this talk, is that they did do some studies to see whether it would predict the response to radiation. So um, I can pause and say that most of the, the biomarkers that we have been talking about are prognostic. In other words, they're going to tell us whether uh, a man will uh, have bad disease. But uh, there's a whole other field of biomarkers looking for predictive biomarkers. In other words, biomarkers that could predict response to treatment. And this is one of them. And in this study, what they did was they took men with high decipher scores up here, and they looked at where they got adjuvant radiation or salvage. So adjuvant right away early, or where they waited till the PSA started going up and got salvage. And, and again, they looked at the incidence of metastasis. And what they're showing here is that if they had a high decipher score and they got earlier radiation in yellow, 
they did quite a bit better. Now, it was only a little over 100 patients, um, but just stay tuned because there's going to be more on this in the future. So does, does this test predict who should get radiation and how they respond to radiation? And I think it's a very interesting question. Lastly, they did do some decision making, and this was was led by the SUOCTC group. Um, and again, I think many many probably on this call were were somewhat involved. This was a multi a huge multi institutional trial, and and John Gore led it. This was the initial uh, the initial publication, and there have been two more since. And they looked at men again who who had prostate cancer that that had treatment already, either considering adjuvant or at time of outcome of a recurrence, their PSA is going up, and deciding whether to get radiation or not. And then it is a simple test where does the cipher um, uh, uh, lend to decision making and it did look like it did and i'll just show you one or two uh, plots on this and this is the uh, over here is without the cipher the red is the men who are choosing radiation the blue is the men who are choosing observation and then after the cipher of course if they have higher decipher scores these are uh, probability of metastasis of higher decipher scores they did end up choosing more radiation it, Kind of makes sense that they would. In the salvage arm, the same thing. These are the men choosing radiation at time of recurrence. And what really was interesting here is that they had low decipher scores. Some of them went from choosing radiation to choosing surveillance instead. Um, fortunately, men that had high decipher scores actually looked like they chose radiation more, which was the point of the test because it does predict uh, radiation use. Again, this is the slide of, of one of the types of reports that you might get. If you order this this decipher test, and you can see here, I always make fun of the company a little bit uh, when I talk to them about this average risk being this tiny little bar here. You're either all low or all high, but this is average risk, and and then they they give you uh, they give the patient where they are. A low decipher score is low risk for metastasis, or a high decipher score has a very high high risk of, uh, of metastasis. Well, I'll end there with um, with uh, just a summary. They they all have multiple publications. They all have high levels of very validation. Um, they 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 have heterogeneous populations, and not all of them are really tested in the intended use population. In other words, I think many of you on the phone might use these tests to understand whether to do it on active do active surveillance or not. But the tests other than Oncotype and our 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 study haven't really been tested in those cohorts. And there's been very few, very few studies that look at financial impact. And I think that's that's a bit of a um, black box because if you can think of, particularly the diagnostic, so you have to do a maybe do an MRI, do a biomarker, you know, you go down the line and get genotyping, and next thing you know, it's thousands of dollars on um, on all those things. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, the last part is just sort of caveats, but first I'll show you what the NCCN says. I think it's important to know this. Um, the NCCN shows this. This is the table that's right in the NCCN. I think it's not going to be different this year. This is last year's version. And, and right here, they're, they're saying don't do these on anybody with high or very high risk disease or even the unfavorable intermediate risk disease. Additionally, what's interesting is they're not recommended by the NCCN for very low risk disease. Um, you can see there, there, there. Where are they? may be considered, they're not recommended, but they're considered in the low risk and the favorable intermediate risk. What's interesting about this is it doesn't really go well with what the insurance providers are doing, just, just to be transparent. And this is another table in, in the NCCN. And again, down here, you can see that all these tests are, are covered by, uh, um, by the molecular diagnostics for use in very low risk, despite the fact the NCCN guidelines say, don't use them in very low risk. So there's that. There's definitely um, uh, that question. There are other caveats. I think uh, again, what are the appropriate thresholds for recommendation? Uh, what's the role of MRI? We we still have a lot to do and a lot lot of work to do. And I'm be interested to hear your thoughts on that. And then, are they are the results actionable? In other words, how do we interpret um, the results? Are they developed in the right populations? Which I can say no for active surveillance. They haven't been. And are they clearly a benefit over clinical models? So keep that last one in mind. I'll show you a couple examples. My reflections on this, just this is just personal bias, is the, the question in my mind goes through is are these tests, are tests at all needed in low volume or low volume Gleason, you know, six disease? Um, there's been multiple studies, randomized clinical trials showing universally excellent results uh, for three plus three disease without these tests. 
And the question is, do we need to do that uh, uh, for, for that disease? And then the other one is a lot of these tests are, as I said before, are reporting prostate cancer mortality and METs. Is, are those really relevant endpoints in low-risk disease? Probably not. And we've all had our patients that have low-risk disease that have had um, bad outcomes, but that's pretty rare. Uh, those are pretty rare. The last thing is decision-making. And I'm gonna show this one uh, again, we showed it earlier, but in my opinion, I mean, some patients do feel that they get some reassurance by a test that indeed the test, the molecular test looks like the, the histology under the microscope. But at the end of the day, um, the middle column really didn't do anything different. Um, and in my opinion, as I just said, very low risk and low risk should have the least intensive therapy. I can't imagine that somehow these men were recommended to have decreased intensity. So these men were probably recommended to have radiation or surgery, but they really were low risk. They should have surveillance. And so I'm not sure that that test really helped in that situation either. At the end of the day, the test might benefit about one in 10. Um, is it worth doing a test um, in 100 men to find the 11? And that's a, it's an open question. Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that. Again, getting back to what we already know, this is a very big study um, that were multiple sites, and they asked the question, does it add to the clinical variable? So they had 561 patients, they all had uh, bad disease, and they said, does this decipher test add to CAPRA, which is just clinical variables? And when you look at it, and here's the results, and you can just say for yourself what you think. The clinical model, or CAPRA, was 0.77 on the AUC. Uh, if you add to Cypher, you get to a 0.79. And again, the question is, is that worth it? Um, and and um, uh, again, there are studies looking at that. The other is you're basing all this on a, usually on a single needle biopsy into a prostate. And this is one of many studies. Michigan has a really good study as well. But basically showed that all these signatures, and they did the, the Oncotype, the Prolaris, and the Cypher on different areas of the same prostate. And when they did it on different areas of the same prostate, they found different signatures. And there is always a question about whether we can do this just based on one little needle biopsy uh, into a prostate. The lastly is the guidelines. What do the guidelines say? Here's one guideline by ASCO. Um, it was kind of a combined uh, ASCO at Cancer Care Ontario. And they basically said that use them when clinical findings are discordant. In other words, maybe high PSAs with just a little bit of cancer in the biopsy, maybe that's a good person to do it on. I'm not sure about that. We have more recent guidelines and the more recent ASCO guidelines, Scott Egener uh, uh, authored this and was led by Misha Beltran as well. And when you look at this, and, and I think it's, it's really worth reading, um, what this, the, I think this is the national guidelines now that tissue-based biomarkers may improve when added to clinical uh, parameters, but the expert panel said only use it in certain situations in which they might change. And they gave examples of those situations. And the situations were high volume grade group one. So, uh, uh, you know, Gleason uh, uh, three plus three kind of packed in the prostate or um, maybe a, a low volume grade group two. So that would be the favorable intermediate risk group. Um, they go further and they say they're not recommended for routine use as they've not been prospectively shown to improve long-term outcomes. And so I think this is a kind of a question um, about whether we should be using these uh, as routine use. I'll end with a clinical trial that's trying to figure this out. And um, this, is, this, is, this is the last slide I have before the take-home points of just showing that um, this group, the, the RTOG, the NRG now, took men and they were men that have already had prostatectomy they already had recurrent disease, and they stack the deck for kind of worse patients. And they're doing a biomarker, which is essentially the cipher, and they're stratifying it. So they're not making that entry criteria, but they're stratifying it, and they're gonna randomize to certain, either radiation with nothing or radiation with hormonal therapy, and really find out where these biomarkers work in truth in real clinical trials, okay, to understand who should get radiation or not, uh, or who should get hormonal therapy or not. And I think that this is the wave of the future. There's like three or four other examples of clinical trials within the cooperative groups that are doing this, that are using molecular markers as either entry criteria or stratification criteria with the hopes that one day we'll use the biomarkers to determine who to even give therapy to. And we'll be more like going full circle to my very first challenge slide. We'll be more like the breast cancer physicians who use biomarkers to really stratify who gets chemo or who gets 
uh, hormonal therapy in their case, or in our case, maybe who gets extra surveillance or who gets radiation uh, or who gets adjuvant therapy. So uh, just take home points here. Um, uh, yeah, multiple tissue-based biomarkers, mostly I think I focus mostly on them because the diagnostics I think are relatively few. Um, they do risk stratified disease beyond the clinical variables. The question again is how much do they do that? I would suggest that we selectively use them, perhaps in the higher volume, three plus three, which again was the recent ASCO guideline, or maybe the favorable intermediate risk patient. There are patients, and again, I know many of you in the, in, on, online have patients who are just, just need a little more data, and I think just need some reassurance. And I do think that those are the patients that might benefit from this, uh, from these tests. There are many caveats to it. And again, most are not really prospectively tested uh, in the right patients. And they're, again, very questionable for use in, in, in low-risk patients. Um, and we have to figure out the cost thing uh, because at this point in time, I'm not sure that the, the cost is worth it in a wide scale uh, at this point in time unless we can figure out who to use the tests on. But I'm, I'm pretty confident that we'll, we'll get there eventually, just give it some time. And, and of course, this will lead to better outcomes uh, for our prostate cancer patients. So thanks for your attention. And, uh, and again, I'm happy to take, take any questions now. Thank you very much, Dr. Lynn. It's a very thorough presentation on a very complex uh, landscape. We've got a couple of questions here in the comments. Um, first one from Dr. Bellamino asking about the Decipher trial. Uh, did the high-grade cancers after radical prostatectomy include those with positive surgical margins? Yeah, they they here is the, the high-grade cancers. Yes, they did. Uh, they did, and and I guess I mean that's getting to kind of like what are the predictors? What are the real predictors uh, of failure after um, after prostatectomy? You know, positive margins, uh, T three disease, um, notable disease, of course, seminal vesicle invasion, and we and others, and I'm sure that you're aware of all the literature that surround that. And positive margins is clearly one of those big factors. When they calculate that in the model, actually, Decipher, it was in the CAPR in some of the models. Some of the models didn't have it, uh, admittedly. So I think that's a great, a great question because positive surgical margins is one of the most highly predictive factors of bowel chemical occurrence after prostatectomy. Obviously, if you're, if you're thinking uh, no negative disease. There's a question from Dr. Mian. Studies to detect changes in decision to treat are a bit funny. The extent and veracity of counseling by an individual urologist is a huge variable. Are there unaccountable predispositions of the patients and doctors, and how do you view these studies? Yeah, yeah great question. Of course, he's going to ask a great question, a hard question. Um, you can't account for it. So, so I, it's a, it's a, I think that that um, that this that the small studies are hampered by that. So if you saw the, the one that I showed, it was a very small study. I think it was like five or six sites, too small of a study. The Neil Shore study with over 1,200 patients was a huge study and had probably hundreds of providers, and that might be too many, uh, too much noise. Um, but I think that there are clearly, clearly predispositions in those studies. It's hard to do a prospective study that's fair. That's those. That's a great. That's a great uh, question. Is there a biomarker you would recommend using in patients who are on five ARIs? <laughs> that's another great question. You know, when I've asked people, first of all, um, we've looked in the Canary Group uh, on the performance of biomarkers with or without five ARIs, and 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 we've done so. We did four K, uh, PCA three. We have select MDX uh, results, and then we published the results on Ocotype. And we've looked at them all. Uh, the archetype one, we actually knocked out anyone with a 5 ARI use. But the other ones, it did not look like 5 ARIs um, affected the results. Those patients taking 5 ARIs had about the same results as others. Now, um, and I don't know where this person that asked this question is from Canada, but I think that the prevalence um, of 5 ARI use, particularly in active surveillance setting, is much higher in Canada. We've done some polls of that. And one of our sites is UBC with Mart Marty Gleave. And there's clearly more five ARI, five ARI use um, in Canada, particularly in the um, in the uh, active surveillance setting. That's a great question, though. 
There's a question regarding multiparametric MRI. Where does it fit in with your use of pre-biopsy genomic markers? Do you think the negative predictive value of some of these tests are accurate given most of the studies were probably performed with standard template rather than targeted biopsies? Yeah. But it depends on the setting. I'm, I mean, I could show some data. I won't. Actually, I think our data might be public. Maybe it's not published yet. It's not. So we have our MPMRI data from the past study accepted to journal urology. Um, this is a tough, this is a tough one. I, I'll be really transparent and say that, um, first of all, to get to your pointed, correct, pointed uh, a, a question about template versus standard template versus with the fusion. Um, we have, we have conflicting data, other people showing that we're finding as many unique cancers with just the standard template as we are with MR fusion. The NPV for most, if you look at most of the data, is not better than 90%. So if you use a threshold of 90% MPV, MPRMRI does not get there. In part, probably because of the inner observer variability of, of MPMRI, that's part of it, I think. Um, there are multiple reasons that it might be, that's one of them. But if you're really thinking that MPV is king, uh, MPMRI does not have the highest, higher MPV than, than, um, than the biomarkers. The question is whether whether those studies, if they had the addition, whether it would, would work or not. There's an ongoing study right now through the SUOCTC called the Priority Study, and that actually is allowing uh, multiparameric MRI, and we're going to have urine studies, tissue-based studies um, with MRI, and we'll be able to compare the two. Um, and I think that that might answer some of those, those questions. There's another study in Europe called the 4M study that I still haven't seen the final results from, um, it was primarily a, a, a Danish study, or maybe it was Nijmegen in the Netherlands, looking at uh, 4M being multiparameter MRI, molecular markers, and some other things. And again, I think that'll get down to the bottom of that question, but it's a, it's a really good question as well. So ideal situation in the, what would be an ideal situation in the repeat biopsy cohort where a molecular mark would appear to be better than MRI? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I, I, again, the ideal situation would be where where the the marker again on on straight performance characteristics would be better. And I think that what would be more important with all these studies is high grade disease. So, the one thing that I think we're ignoring is this overdiagnosis of three plus three disease. And there are many people out there who are still on a mission. To try to rename three plus three to be something um, not cancer, uh, like the uh, like pun lump or something. Uh, I mean, there are other tongue in cheek things that they're saying, but I think that we don't we don't want to find three plus three disease. So the ideal situation would be, uh, you know, but our would be somebody that uh, we could find high grade disease that would be better than MRI. Um, I will say that Py Pyrads fives are 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 going to probably bubble up to be the the one that we have to worry about, and Pyrads fours and threes are a question. It's amazing that that there's really good data to show that if you look at your institutional proportion of Pyrads threes, and depending on how high that is, it can almost be a marker for um, inadequate radiology reading. Um, there's been some movement about saying that. Uh, pyrides three, maybe even four, but threes mostly are kind of a hedge when the uh, and they shouldn't hedge. It's, it should be either something suspicious or not. So I think that um, the comparisons are going to be um, take take quite quite some time. But I, again, I'm pretty confident over the next few years we'll get to the bottom of some of those. Let's see. I can't. Where are we on the questions here? Uh, next question would be from Dr. Fisher. Uh, is the decipher decipher adjuvant versus salvage RT study? What were the thresholds for use of salvage? Uh, yeah, great question. So the thresholds, the PSA threshold, I think that might have been was point was the AUA definition of 0.2 times two. Um, that's what was recommended. Although I will say that a few of those people did have ultra-sensitive PSAs that were clearly rising in the setting of high-risk disease, and they were going to get salvaged, and we allowed them to have this decision analysis of whether they wanted to get salvaged or not, even based on the PSA that was less than 0.2. But technically, and again, kind of testable for the residents on the line, you know, the AUA definition is 0.2 times 2, and 
Um, if, a, if a man hasn't gotten there yet, he technically, the, the surgery technically hasn't failed him. Um, but that was, that was our threshold. Uh, really good question on the, from, of course, Dr. Kogan's going to ask really good questions too about biomarkers in high versus low risk populations. So um, there have been point, very pointed um, uh, discussions of the biomarkers in, particularly in African Americans. So uh, Steve Freeland published a paper for uh, the, for Prolaris, showing that Prolaris uh, performed equally well um, in the African population in the Durham VA. Um, we have looked at the biomarkers in the active surveillance population. Um, I think Steve's was in the radical prostatectomy population, but we've looked in the active surveillance, showing that the biomarkers do perform equally well. Um, in, in the African Americans. The San Antonio group is now looking at the Hispanic population because they have a very high Hispanic population, of course, in, in that area of Texas. Um, but I think that's a that's the next uh, wave. The problem is the numbers. As you know, um, most studies are less than 10% uh, in these um, uh, uh, minority populations, and we just we just need to get get uh, more patients in there. See, what's the next one? It's like the last one on the list here is in someone who has DNA methylation positive for confirmed MDX, but PSA is stable, would you rebiopsy or surveil? I probably I would rebiopsy. I would because I think that we know PSA is not that reliable in in, in general sometimes, if that, particularly after a previous biopsy. And in these settings, what I would do uh, would kind of believe the methylation, and I would I would rebiopsy in that setting. I probably would not just rebiopsy in the place of methylation, but I would probably do maybe oversample that area and then do uh, other biopsies. What usually happens in this setting is an MRI, right? I mean, I think that uh, what what could have been on the end of that question is what happens to stable PSA and an MRI that's normal. That's a tough one. But then again, then there you've done an MRI. Few thousand dollars, a confirmed MDX, a couple thousand dollars, and now we're getting along on the cost train, right? And then a biopsy, which is a couple thousand dollars. So, um, I think we have, we have a ways to go on both of those. The, the priority study, which we're running again, will answer, I think, some that exact question um, with regards to uh, MRI, stable PSA, we're gonna have all their PSAs, and we guys got to get the, we got to get the study done, but uh, we will, I hope so. The pri how many patients in the priority study? We have a thousand patient study. We're about three fifty in, maybe four hundred. We got to get going, and um, uh, we're we're on our way. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lin. Um, thank you everyone for joining us, and I think uh, that's the end for today. Unless there's any more questions or comments. Excellent talk, Dan. Yeah, Very thanks. Well done. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. We'll be checking soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Good to see everybody. Stay safe. Thanks. Okay, Bye -bye. take care.